Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, on behalf of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, I'd like to welcome you all for this uh, ICTS public lecture on the Ramanujam conjecture and some Diophantine equations, which is jointly organized by the International Center for Theoretical Sciences of TIFR and the School of Mathematics of TIFR. So we are very honored to have uh, Professor Peter Sarnak deliver this lecture. And uh, I'd like to add that Professor Sarnak is visiting TIFR uh, to deliver the ICTS uh, Srinivasa Ramanujam lectures, which will be held uh, next week. There are four lectures, uh, one every day at 11.30, precisely in this uh, lecture hall. And uh, you're all welcome to attend those. Uh, <coughs> I'd like to say that, uh, just an observation, that this is the fourth public lecture in mathematics that uh, we are having uh, here. Uh, the first one, as you remember, was by Benedict Ross, the second by Terence Tao, the third by Tian Gies, and uh, this present one by Professor Sarnak. And I guess uh, uh, this is all inspired in part by the fact that uh, this is the 125th birth anniversary of Srinivasa Ramanujam. So I'll say no more, but invite uh, Jyoti Sengupta to introduce the speaker, Jyoti. Yeah, it is an uh, good afternoon. It is an honor and privilege for me to introduce today's distinguished speaker, Peter Sarnak. Ever since I met him at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, I've been wondering when he'll be able to visit TIFR. This has indeed happened thanks to Spenta. Peter Sarnak did his BSc honors from the University of Witwatersrand, South Africa in 75. After that, he went to USA where he earned a PhD in 1980 from Stanford University under the supervision of Paul Cohen. After his PhD, he spent some time in Courant Institute as a faculty member and then moved to Stanford in 1987. In 1991, he joined Princeton University, where he's presently the Eugene Higgins Professor of Mathematics. He's also a permanent faculty member of the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton. Sarnak's research interests are in number theory, ergodic theory, and analysis. He has made several far-reaching conjectures in these fields. The importance of his contributions are well recognized. He's the recipient of several prizes and awards. To name a few, he is the recipient of Polia Prize of the Society of Industrial and Applied Mathematics, the Levy Conant Prize, and the Frank Nelson Cole Prize in Number Theory. He was also elected a member of the National Academy of Sciences USA and Fellow of the Royal Society UK. He was awarded an honorary doctorate by the Hebrew University Jerusalem in 2010. So this far I go. With this, I conclude my introduction. And I am sure that we have a very exciting and stimulating time ahead. So I invite Prof. Peter to give his lecture. Thank you very much. Well, I have a loud voice, but I guess this is working. Uh, it's a great honor for me to give these lectures and to be here in India for the second time and in Mumbai for the first time. Ramana Jan has been a great inspiration for much of my work. So. This is a special honor on his 125. He would have been had he lived this long, I guess. Uh, and I dedicate this to him, as you'll see. OK, so let's start with his paper, with his conjecture. Ramanujan made many contributions in many different directions. But when we talk of the Ramanujan conjecture, it usually means this. Primarily because uh, it's had such an impact, broad and deep. Um, this lecture, as was pointed out, I'll give four lectures next week, some of which will continue threads of this lecture. But this lecture is meant to be a public lecture, so I hope everybody can follow most of it. So we start with the delta function, which is a very important function, but as I've presented here, it looks pretty strange why you would just look at this expression. Q times 1 minus Q times 1 minus Q squared 
I mean, the Q's on the outside and the other parentheses on the inside to the power 24. I'll explain the importance of this function a little later. If we multiply that out and collect terms, you get only finitely many terms in front of each power of Q. And you get a series which uh, defines integers called tau of n. And Ramanujan's famous conjecture concerns these integers. So if you compute this, the first term is clearly Q, and then the 1 minus Q to the 24 will give you minus 24 Q in the next term. And if you collect the first few terms, you'll get these numbers as I have indicated over there. And if uh, you were just an ordinary person, you would stop there and say, that's that. But Ramanujan observed two great things in this 1916 paper of his. The first, you already see that, and I think most, uh, uh, I think this would have been found anyway, the first thing. That is that if you take tau of 2 times tau of 3, that's tau of 6, and more generally, tau of m times n, they, these coefficients at the value mn, is the product tau of m times tau, e, tau of n, as long as m and n have no common factors. So I think that probably would have been observed by someone else. The second is one of the deepest insights in mathematics. It's very hard to overstate how he thought of this. I'm going to try to explain where he might have come. I'm sure I know where he came, why he was interested in this. And that is that at a prime, and hence at an integer from the first relation, that tau p is at most 2p to the 11 over 2. That's the famous Ramanujan conjecture. Stated that way, it looks like, well, this might not be such an interesting problem. Why is he so interested in it? Well, let me tell you some stories about people fighting over this, firstly. Just the statement. Uh, I hope maybe you can't all see this at the back. Uh, so let me just tell you what this is. This is from the paper. This is a table he makes. He computes tau up to 30 and observes the multiplicativity and this magnitude statement. He then points out that it's an interesting problem to estimate how big tau of n is. And he comes up with this exponent 11 over 2. He discusses it at every integer n, not just at primes. And then he very clearly makes the two conjectures I stated, the multiplicativity property, that's this equation here. He then has a quite astonishing misprint that I'd never noticed until I prepared this lecture. He's got the two on the wrong side, <laughs> which I found quite strange. But maybe he never proofread his papers. I can tell you some jokes about misstating this in conferences here in India and around the world when people um, announce things or make pla uh, posters for conferences. Anyway, it's stated very clearly here that tau of n is at most n to the 11 over 2 times d of n, which is the number of divisors of n, which is what you would get from the multiplicativity property properly understood and this most important conjecture that tau of p is at most 2 p to the 11 over 2. So that's the 1916 paper where he makes his famous conjecture. Now, let me tell you two people who write about this. Hardy, Hardy, uh, I will not repeat, I'm sure most people know the story about Hardy and Ramanujan writing to Hardy and Ramanujan working with Hardy. Um, but in his book, 12 Lectures on Ramanujan, Lecture 10, he discusses this conjecture. So he states the, the title of the uh, chapter is Ramanujan's function tau of n. And he gives exactly the definition I gave. And then he says he devotes this to this conjecture. Very remarkable. And he's saying tau of n is, not per, is imperfectly understood. And then he carries on to say, we may seem to be straying into the backwaters of mathematics. But then he assures us that this is tau of n is an important function. So, he suggests, so he's not giving you a completely convincing reason why this is such an important problem when he's writing about this. And uh, I'm saying it is very important. Now, in 1974, maybe it was 72, but in 74 when this was published, Ve is writing about, Ve was a nasty guy, a uh, brilliant guy, but quite a nasty guy. And he liked to attack people. And he is attacking, not Ramanujan, he, he did... He had great appreciation of Ramanujan, but he's attacking Hardy. I don't know exactly why. Well, I think I do know why. Uh, he's trying to say, so the preface to this discussion of this point 
is he's trying to say, what is number theory? And he, say, he says something like, I can't define it for you. It's like a fox and a rabbit. If a fox sees, you don't need to define a rabbit for a fox. It'll, when it sees the rabbit, it knows what to do. It'll, it, know, it recognizes it. And he says, when I see number theory, I know what it is. And what Hardy does is not number theory. Now, I don't know what, what's so important about this. Uh, I mean, I guess he's trying to say number theorists are more important than other people. I guess I could agree with that. But uh, I'm not sure that, what, what, what the place of this is. But then he's got a proof that Hardy is not a number theorist because he says that when he discusses this tau of p, he points out that uh, Hardy says, we are straying to the backwaters of mathematics. So he repeats what Hardy said over here. And he says, I don't know any number theorist in the world, this is 1972, just before this was proved, who wouldn't be very happy or extremely pleased to prove this. This is one of the great unsolved problems in number theory. And Hardy shows, to Hardy, this was just some silly inequality that Ramanujan was interested in. And since Ramanujan was interested in it, it was probably important. So his attack is on Hardy. But you can see that they are both uh, just repeating this inequality. And I wanted to give you two views on this. All right, I will try to explain to you why it's important. The problem was solved. The first problem of the multiplicativity of tau, the property that I said most professional mathematicians who would have got to that point might have noticed that, was proved by Mordell very early on soon after Ramanujan's paper, uh, using ideas that go back to Hurwitz. But it was a very important development. So Ramanujan's impetus here was critical because it led Hecker to the modern theory of modular forms, which I'll say a bit more about. Uh, and Hecker developed that based on Model's proof of that first question of Ramanujan. The second one, as I've been saying, is a very deep thing. It was proved by Pierre Deligne using, he proved something called the Vey conjectures. This is arithmetic geometry. Very sophisticated and beautiful mathematics. And one of the high points of, of the applications of his results is to prove the original conjecture of Ramanujan. And here's Pierre Deligne. He's a colleague of mine at the Institute for Advanced Studies. And to show you, he was recently made a count in Belgium. He's from Belgium. And on his stamp, on the stamp that they made for him, Guess what they, they have? Tau of p less than equal to 2p to 11 over 2. So even, I don't know if they asked him or if they just decided what to put on the stamp. Uh, it is appreciated. So, of course, he proved the Vey conjectures, which you could argue it's the same Vey that I mentioned before. But this is one of the most stunning applications of it. I thought, well, if we have a stamp of, of uh, Deligne, I found, managed to find a stamp of Ramanujan as well. But no, tau of p less than or equal to p to the 11 over 2 there. So this has a nice history. And even in the ICM a uh, couple of years ago here in India, the emblem has tau of n less than or equal to n to the 11 over 2 times d of n. So I think if there is, if we go by just publicity, it's clearly an important conjecture. I think that. Uh, Hardy knew a lot more about why this was important. I think what he said was a bit tongue-in-cheek. I think Hardy really appreciated much of Ramanujan's work. He admired him. I think Hardy's work went to a different level by working with Ramanujan. So I think Vey's, uh, I, I think Vey actually didn't quite understand why Ramanujan was interested in this. So I'm now going to argue wh how Ramanujan came to this and show you its impact. For him, this was quite natural. All right, so in order to understand that it's not just some estimate, some inequality that is in the backwaters of mathematics, let me remind you what a modular form is. So you'll need to know this for a little bit, but not for too long. So if we make the variable Q that we saw on the first slide equal e to the 2 pi i z, and we put z in the upper half plane, so the imaginary part of z is positive, so we just put q equal e to the 2 pi and z. Then we get a function of z, delta of z, which has got this expansion. It's called the Fourier expansion, n equals 1 to infinity of tau of n e to the 2 pi and z. It's now a holomorphic function, analytic function in the upper half plane. It's actually a discriminant of a cubic. So it's a well-known function that had been studied 
and looked at in many contexts. It was Ramanujan who first studied the coefficients deeply. And its importance lies in the fact <coughs> that it's got a periodicity property which defines modular forms. And if there's one modular form that uh, I, if we had sent a rocket out into space and we were allowed to send one modular form out there for the, another civilization to learn what we're doing, it would be this one, probably with the estimate for tau along with it. And what is that remarkable property? It's a periodicity property that if you take delta and you evaluate it at this expression, az plus b over cz plus d, which is a linear fractional transformation in z, which takes the upper half plane back into itself. So this is a new point at which delta is defined. You'll get what delta is times this factor at the bottom, cz plus d to the 12. So it's a modular form of weight 12. It's holomorphic. And the transformations under which it's periodic are the two by two matrices with whole number entries. So A, B, C, D are integers, and this group is called SL2Z. So this transformation property was well known before. It's, come, it's a standard thing in elliptic modular functions. And it's for this, transforma this prom transformation property and the fact that it's holomorphic that uh, makes this function so important, and hence also the coefficient. So this is why Ramanujan was looking at it. So they are coefficients of a modular form. Now, you might wonder why modular forms are something one might want to look at. And as I say, Ramanujan really defined the transition from, I would say, 19th century modular forms to 20th century. As I said, after Hecker, the thing changed, and Ramanujan was a catalyst for that. So in the 19th century, people were making these expansions and studying them one way. And today, they are the goldmine of mathematics. Uh, I like, to, you might, someone should write like there's a well-known paper of uh, Wigner, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in physics, I think is what it is. Somebody should write a paper, one of you young guys in this field, the unreasonable effectiveness of modular forms in number theory. Why, why would modular forms tell you so much about Diophantine equations when they don't seem to be related to them in any way? like the proof of Fermat's last theorem or something of that nature. And the reason, my view, my answer to that would be that modular forms are things you almost can compute to the bitter end. So if you can philosophize and just think, you'll get a certain distance. But at some point, you have to be able to compute things that are more than the roots of a quadratic equation. And modular forms are things we can compute very far, but they are highly non-explicit. So these tau of n's are quite mysterious, but we can still compute them from many different angles and prove amazing things on the basis of the ability to compute very far. This is my view. Anyway, they are the gold mine of modern mathematics, so this is the most central and first serious modular form one comes across. I am sure that Ramanujan was well aware, as you will see as I discuss further here, that his conjecture wasn't restricted just to delta, but to any holomorphic cusp form, because he was working with them all the time. And in fact, I will argue that that's why he made this conjecture. He doesn't give too much of a reason, except that in the paper, you'll see problems that are related to what I'll turn to. These modular forms are just about two by two matrices. As you saw, we had AZ plus B over CZ plus D. Today, we have a very general theory which involves N by N matrices, and the whole yoga goes under the name Langlands program. This is where all the modular forms are supposed to live. They're all supposed to live on N by N matrices. And one of the great unsolved problems there, and I will turn to that in the next lecture, is what are the Ramanujan conjectures in the general setting and why they are so important there. And there we certainly haven't solved them. In fact, even in our path plane, they're not completely solved. Uh, yet we have very, very important approximations to them, which allow us to solve the kind of problems that Ramanujan was interested in. So I'm, this slide is just meant to indicate to you the importance of modular forms. And that's why delta was so important to many of us and to Ramanujan too. He was well aware of it, that he wasn't just talking about delta. Okay, so they're far-reaching things. So I want to now explain where Ramanujan was coming from, and then I'm going to give you some Diophantine applications of that type and more difficult ones, and that's the aim of the lecture. So Ramanujan was very interested. I don't know exactly when he learned these things. Uh, and what he learned when he came to Cambridge, but at this 1916 paper, and 1917 is his next paper that's related, 
He was very interested in this old theorem of Lagrange and variations of it about which numbers are representable as sums of squares. So this is what number theory is about. You try to solve Diophantine equations. The much more interesting thing, Dick Gross spoke here before me. I'm sure he told you about solving equations using uh, Birchwinet and I. He must have spoken about that. I don't know what he spoke about, but I could guess. So the fact that you can't solve equations is far more boring than the fact, like Fermat's last theorem, than that you can solve equations when there should be solutions. That's, but we have very few ways of solving equations because it's very hard to produce integer solutions to equations. You don't have the luxury of making up numbers like complex numbers or real numbers to solve the equation. So you're actually going to try find solutions and these are the pleasing things. So Lagrange's theorem says that every positive number is a sum of four squares. You'll find this in most elementary books in the theory of numbers. There are many, many proofs. There are proofs using modular forms. There are elementary proofs. So this is something that Ramanujan was very interested in. And he was interested in generalizing this statement to a more general equation. Why sum of four squares? Why not put coefficients here? So suppose I have a quadratic form. The A, B, C, D, C and D are all positive whole numbers. Say they have no common factor amongst them. <coughs> They're positive. And you could ask which numbers, for which n's can you solve f of x equals n? It's a very natural generalization of this question. And he was very interested in w for which f's is it true that every positive number can be represented by f. He, we call them, or he called them, universal forms. So here's the key it's the beginning of his paper on the expression of a number in the form of a quadratic form, a quaternary quadratic form, with the coefficients a, b, c, and d are fixed. And he, what he says, he's going to show there are exactly 55 such forms for which it is true that every positive number is, a sum, is represented by that form. It's quite remarkable, and he proceeds to solve this, to prove that. There are 55 sets. Uh, there are finitely many, and he determines them all. He then says, what is a much more interesting problem about, and, and is much more difficult and interesting, is which positive numbers, which you look for f's so that you can represent every large positive number, maybe with finitely many exceptions. That's a much bigger list, and he doesn't know how to handle it. But that's very close to his conjecture. That's why he was making the conjecture, as I will explain. All right, uh, just to bring you up to date, Conway is always able to come up with some amazing, he's a great inventor of the game of life and any variation of problems with a twist that's got a nice sting at the bottom. And here's another example, Conway and Schnee Schienberger, a student of his some years ago, were very interested in generalizing this theorem of Ramanujan and other people too, to where you don't, the form is not in diagonal, but it's an arbitrary quadratic form in four variables, and you call it universal if it represents every positive number. And they formulated a theorem which was then, and a conjecture which was then proved beautifully by Manjul Bhargava at Princeton and Hanke, who also was at Princeton when they proved this, the 290 theorem. And I think Ramanujan would have loved this. It's a beautiful theorem. And the theorem says that the necessary and sufficient condition for a, num for a form to be universal, meaning it represents every positive number, doesn't matter how many variables even it's in, it'll have to be in four more variables to be universal, is that it represent every number up to 290. Well, clearly, uh, if you're going to represent all numbers, you better represent all the numbers up to 290. So you check, do you, and that you can check by hand. If it's positive, definite, you just check. And if you get all the numbers up to 290, you're in business. You represent everybody else for free. Uh, the most amazing thing about this is the formulation of the problem. I think Ramanujan would have been quite taken by this statement. It is a beautiful statement. So it's called the 290 theorem. Let me get back to what Ramanujan would have been doing here and what he does in this paper in order to solve this problem of which numbers are represented by a quaternary quadratic form. So the connection to his Ramanujan conjecture is the following, which he understands very well because he manipulates with these things in the paper. Today we would do it in a much more systematic way, but he has, was a genius in manipulating series and in manipulating especially modular forms 
in the upper half plane and their expansions. So let R f of n be the number of solutions to f of x equals n, where f is his form. So it's a positive definite form. So the, everything is to be solved in whole numbers. f of x, you want to solve f of x equals n. It's got only finitely many solutions. So this is a whole number. And it turns out that using the theory of modular forms that he knew well, you can write this as a, a term which is very explicit that he discusses in the paper even where he's making his conjectures in connection with other sums of squares. So I won't say any more other than to say it's explicit and we understand when it's zero or not and even how big this quantity is. So from the theory of modular forms, the number of representations of n by f, which is what we're interested in showing this is not zero, is equal to something explicit plus something which is the coefficient of something like tau. The coefficient of a cusp form is what technically it is. So this is explicit and it's got size about n when you have four variables if it's not zero and if it's zero it's for obvious reasons of divisibilities. So I, re I repeat this is entirely explicit. The second term, if he, the analog of his Ramanujan conjecture which was that at a prime p and then the multiplicativity properties will give you the rest. Remember his bound for tau of p was that it was, the conjectured bound was at most 2p to the 11 over 2. If you in four variables you would get that this is supposed to be at most 2p to the half. And so from the multiplicativity you get that the number of solutions, the number of representations of n by f is an explicit thing which is about size n and something which is much smaller if he could prove his conjecture. And he remarks that. And that's exactly, and in, in his Ramanujan conjecture, he, say, he makes very clear why he wants the bound, and then he analyzes it sufficiently deeply to understand what the optimal bound would be. You can't do better than p to the 11 over 2. So he's very much interested in this error term, if you wish, being small so that he could solve these kind of problems. And of course, if this is true, that that's about n, and this might be at most root n with some big constant, then once n is large, that's his second problem, which he says is much more interesting and much more difficult. Once n is large, you would know that you can have, uh, you're representing n, because this will be, bit, this is smaller than that, so this quantity is positive. So this really is at the heart of this paper, these two papers that he writes one after the other, and there's a very good reason why he makes a conjecture because he wanted to solve these Diophantine problems. And in fact, this led him, in order to understand this universal form in four variables, he was quickly led to studying forms in three variables, which is much more difficult. And I want to cite from his same paper, but before I do that, I want to remind you about three variables because this leads me to the main theme that he was very interested in himself. So, Lagrange is this theorem that every positive number is a sum of four squares, which most people know, even, well, a lot of people know. <laughs> uh, amongst mathematicians, much fewer people know, far fewer people know that which numbers are sum of three squares. But this has a much greater history than the Lagrange theorem, and it's much more subtle. Because for three, not every positive number is a sum of three squares, and this was understood certainly early on. For example, and this is going to be a local to global principle, and that's what Ramanujan was after here in this three variables, and it's going to be the theme of what I'm talking about. So notice that if I do arithmetic and divide by eight, so all the, I look at all numbers and I look at remainders you get when you divide by eight, you can get remainder which is zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven. And so, if you're going to write a number as a sum of three squares and you look mod 8, a quick inspection will show you that the squares of any number in, in remainders mod 8 can only give you 0 or 1 or 4. And summing three of those will never give you 7. So, any number which gives remainder 7 when divided by 8 cannot be written as a sum of three squares. And any number which is of this form, 4 to the a by a simple variation cannot be written as a sum of three squares. So it was quickly understood by Euler and people like this who were looking at this, who were very interested in which numbers are sums of three squares. So you want to solve this Diophantine equation over the whole numbers. That you cannot solve uh, this if there's, if you look, if, if when you look at remainders 
Mod 8, there's this problem. So that's called a local obstruction. If there's a local obstruction, you cannot solve it. The great theorem is that if that local obstruction is not present, you can solve it. And that's a remarkable thing. This is a theorem which I think is really due to Gauss. Now, I used to think it was Legendre. Uh, according to Vey, Vey's always got something to say. He was writing a lot about <laughs> these things. Uh, at some point, he decides Legendre doesn't have a proof. And Serum then agrees with him. Uh, it's, I guess Legendre certainly claimed he had a proof, but whether he had a proof or not is not completely clear. Anyway, Gauss proved this, and it's one of his great theorems. In his Disquestion, his Arithmeticae, he makes the entry Eureka. When he proved this, he was so excited. He carries on saying he's been, his ideas how to prove this. At the bottom of his entry, it says, by the way, my fifth child was born today. And this was clearly a minor thing compared to <laughs> the proof of this uh, local to global principle. Uh, I think. Okay, <laughs> that's a bit much. Anyway, it is a remarkable theorem, and the reason it's remarkable is this is the proof that Gauss gives his high school math. It's really quite brilliant. Um, it's remarkable because to start out with, you just have this n, it's past this congruence, and now you're going to find x1, x2, x3. You don't, you don't have a formula for it, but you're going to find these numbers. He, didn't, he wasn't using modular forms. So it's one of the remarkable theorems, and it's much more difficult than Lagrange's theorem. And Ramanujan, in studying these universal forms, was led to other f equations, as you can imagine, because he was changing the coefficients in three variables, and the miracle that Gauss had here that he could do this was all of a sudden gone, and even Ramanujan couldn't guess what was going on. So I just quote here from his 1917 pa papers on quadratic forms in four variables, He's now down to three variables, and he's trying to understand when is x squared plus y squared plus 10z squared, which numbers does it represent? So it's not a sum of three squares, it's just this coefficient 10 over there that he needs to incorporate. And that makes the problem extremely difficult. In fact, we don't even know how to solve it today. It's not completely understood, but it's almost understood. So what Ramanujan observes is, firstly, he understands very well the local obstruction. So he says every number of the form 4 to the lambda times 16 mu plus 6, uh, the numbers which are not, so any even number which is of this form cannot be represented. So he finds a local obstruction like I described before. And then he says every other even number which is not of this type is represented. So he's quite happy with that because it's at the level of Gauss's theorem. But the next line, he says, which, the, with the odd numbers, it's much more mysterious. So he lists here a list of about 12 numbers that odd numbers, there's no local obstruction for this form. So the 10 doesn't impact that. So odd, every odd number should be represented. And he says, look, I've got 12 exceptions here. And then he says, they don't seem to follow a simple law. Now, he would have known what law to look for here, but he didn't have computers or anything. So he stops there and he says, I don't know. So today, we know something spectacular about this. We know that this list is finite. So you might say, well, isn't that the whole story? It's ineffective. So the proof is so involved and embedded in the difficulties of certain things that I won't go into, that what we know in this problem, and it's due to Duke, Ivanietz, and Schulze Pilot, the breakthrough, Duke, uh, Ivanich made a certain technical breakthrough, Duke, this is really Duke's theorem, and Schulze Pilot explained the application into this problem, <coughs> is that we know that this list will contain also these two numbers. These were found by computer later. So I'll, re I'll return to this in a minute. So we have Ramanujan's list. We add these two numbers that are also not represented, which morally should be represented, so they are exceptions. You add them in, and we have this list of numbers which should be all of them, actually. And what we know is the list is finite. In fact, what we really know is there's at most one more guy. But until you find one more exception, you never know whether it's one more or whether you, there's no effective procedure to decide from the proof that's offered whether your list is complete. So maybe for Ramanujan, he'd say, what is this? Is this magic? Is this real mathematics? I don't know. For me, this is more than enough. This list is finite. That's the stable statement. 
It's just unfortunate that the proof is not effective. So I repeat, it is effective in the number. That is, we have this many, and there can be at most one more exception. I won't go into why that's the case, but I think that might indicate to you that there's some lack of understanding on the one hand, and on the other hand, the proof is probably very complicated. It uses modular forms in fundamental ways, and it uses many ineffective arguments of Ziegel, which is why it's in the state. state uh, sorry. Okay, so if you assume something called the generalized Riemann hypothesis, something for which you can get a million dollars if you just prove the ordinary Riemann hypothesis, uh, not true. Actually, true. I believe the clay will pay you a million dollars if you prove the Riemann hypothesis. But if you disprove it, they have a little lawyer statement at the bottom there that I've noticed. They may not pay you. <laughs> Only I would notice that. <laughs> I'm not trying to disprove it. I asked Wiles, who was sort of the lawyer formulating that, and uh, I said, are you serious? If somebody disproves it, you're not going to pay them? Well, they, 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 they were worried about some other conjecture called the Hodge conjectures, that they may be false just because there's some twisted version that nobody's thought of and formally it's false and then they don't like the idea of paying out a million dollars for somebody who says we need to reformulate the conjecture this way so then they made this universal silly statement that in all the problems if you disprove the conjecture we have the right not to pay you. we will decide whether to pay you. so i found that uh strange anyway if you assume the riemann hypothesis it's true don't worry about it uh, the generalized, it's quite seriously generalized, then Ono and Sandararajan have shown that the finite list that you see over here, together with these two that you can find on a computer very easily, is indeed the entire list. So there is no further exception, conjecturally. And that's this problem. So this problem of, of, of uh, Ramanujan is now at that, so except for the ineffectivity, and the ineffectivity would disappear if you knew the Riemann hypothesis. So I think these are the reasons that Ramanujan made the conjecture. He was very interested in this problem. He didn't seem to be aware that this was a well-known problem called Hilbert's 11th problem. So I just want to review this problem for you because it's, again, a misunderstanding as to what this problem is if you look at it very carefully. So that's Hilbert and his famous problem stated in German. This is a translation. Our pre present knowledge of the theory of quadratic number fields, he just started what is called class field theory, puts us in a position to attack successfully the theory of quadratic forms in any number of variables and with algebraic numerical coefficients. So he's going to allow the coefficients and the problem to be in what is called a number field. That's a generalization he's very interested in. This leads in particular to the interesting problem to solve a given quadratic equation with algebraic numerical coefficients by integral or fractional numbers belonging to the algebraic realm of rationality determined by the coefficients, and then he refers to his own paper on the beginnings of class field theory. So what he's saying here is, let's try to solve a quadratic equation, not just over the whole numbers or the rational numbers, but over integers and rational numbers in a number field. And he clearly understands that his class field theory will play a role in this. So he's generalized the problem of which... Uh, <coughs> Ramanujan's looking at a special case and asking to solve this. All right, this is a very interesting problem. It's certainly of the flavor we just described. It's Hilbert's 11th problem. And it's well known that Hasse solved this problem in the version where you want to solve it in the rational numbers in a number field, which is the f second half of what Hilbert asked. Hilbert was interested in both solving it over the integers and over the rationals. So over the rationals, Hasse's solution is absolutely stunning. It's one of the great theorems in the theory of numbers because it says there's a local to global principle. You can solve, if you can solve locally, and locally doesn't just mean mod 8, it means mod all prime powers or over the piadics and over the reals, then you can solve over the rationals. An obvious necessary condition is sufficient to solve the equation completely. So that's why it's such a celebrated theorem. But it's only half and the easy half of Hilbert's problem. In fact, it was Siegel who spent many years trying to solve the general case. And he was able, following Ramanujan actually, and he was able to get it down to five variables and then Knezer to four variables. Castle's improved in four variables. Two variables, 
uh, there's no local to global principle of the same type. It's class field theory. It's a theory of quadratic extensions as Hilbert understood. So the most difficult case is three variables and a uh, major breakthrough was made by Duke, Fre uh, Duke Ivanietz and Schulze Pilow, as I mentioned. Those techniques did not generalize to a number field, but Piotrowski, Shapiro, Cogdell and myself were able to solve the three variable case, again ineffectively, thus solving this problem. I want to point out that in our proof, one of the key ingredients is the Ramanujan conjecture for exotic mass forms. So these are not holomorphic functions. These are more like functions of mathematical physics, which also apparently obey, but never been proved to satisfy the Ramanujan conjectures. There's a complete analog. I'll talk about that next week. And we know great progress towards it. So it's again the Ramanuj ordinary Ramanujan conjectures properly generalized that are playing a critical role in the solution to this. So when I said that Ramanujan's impact with that conjecture is massive, I really meant it, at least in these problems he was interested in, like sums of three squares over a number field. Now, there are many, many other applications of Ramanujan's conjectures. I want to mention one very briefly, just in case, because it's a general lecture. There are applications to combinatorics and computer science. There are something called Ramanujan graphs, whose the, the construction of the graphs is not due to Ramanujan, but the fact that they have the properties that are so desirable, which I'll mention in a word, is no more, no less, that Ramanujan's conjecture is used in the proof. The bound for the tau of p and its analogs eventually becomes a bound for an eigenvalue, a spectral gap, and this is the critical input to show these graphs have these properties. And these properties are that you're trying to make a graph which is very sparse and at the same time very highly connected. So you can imagine this is extremely useful in connecting telephone wires or in, uh, in de-randomization, all of which is true. There are a massive subject called expanders, graphs which are expanders, which are now sort of bread and butter in computer science. The interesting thing is that the actually best expanders that you can make, and not just that has been made, but you cannot make them better, completely optimal, and that's really the interest here, are graphs that you make out of using eventually Ramanujan's conjecture. I should say that you don't need the full force of the Ramanujan conjecture as proved by Deline. There's some name I, one should never omit here because the fact that Ramanujan's, as I told you, in four variables, Ramanujan's conjecture reduces to the weight 2 case, not the weight 12 case of the holomorphic forms. And that was solved long before Deline. And this guy really is, in many ways, the father of many, many great ideas in modern automorphic forms and number theory, and that's Eichler. Eichler had connected the Ramanujan conjecture, which I'm so interested in this lecture, the original Ramanujan conjecture, not for weight 12, but for weight 2, to the Riemann hypothesis for curves over finite fields, which is what Deline solved in a greater generality. In fact, that exact theorem, the Riemann hypothesis for curves over finite fields, was proved by none other than Andre Weyer. <laughs> so <laughs> this is all very closely knit, and each guy's got his view, and we'll have to entertain them. Anyway, these graphs are used, and uh, I think when this was first introduced, I thought that would just be something that would disappear, but it's just really uh, apparently very seriously useful. Here is a picture of the largest Ramanujan graph, which is planar, that we know, cubic. So we know that you, if you try to keep it this highly connected feature and have three guys coming out of each vertex, so this is very sparse and highly connected in a way that I haven't defined for you. And if you try to keep it in the plane so that you could draw it in the plane, then we know from computer science that the biggest it could ever be is about 300 vertices. We don't know the optimal. This is the biggest we know, which comes from actually chemistry, from certain fullerenes. So these are very interesting graphs. Their main interest, of course, is not to put them in the plane when you're connecting telephone wires or you have some switching networks. You have three dimensions or you have some global uh, system which does not force you to stick in the plane. All right. I want to spend the last 15 minutes in telling you about something that I 
Ramanujan didn't look at. I looked at his works. I'd see no evidence that he thought about Apollonian packings. Maybe I've missed something. But I want to show you a problem which, again, uses Ramanujan's conjecture as extended to situations that are very novel. And I want to therefore bring, do, at least mention something that's more recent. And these are works that in the last five years that many people are involved in. So if you haven't followed up till now, you should be able to start from a fresh year and pretend you're Ramanujan. I'm sure you'll find it interesting. This is a Diophantine problem, which is much harder than Hilbert's 11th problem. And it's born hard. And I want to explain that. All right, so let's take, I'm going to tell you what an Apollonian packing is. But first, let me take a quarter, a nickel, and a dime. It took me four days to find the quarter, nickel, and a dime to have a certain arithmetic property. So I don't know what the official diameter of a quarter, nickel, and dime is. I looked at many denominations. And these events, this was the last thing I looked at. I looked at many South African coins, thinking that would be what I want to put up here. Uh, in this lecture or some other lectures I've given on this. The property I want is that if I put a circle, so these four, uh, these are going to have r rational diameters. Okay, so you could argue whether the mint in India or in any country have in mind that the diameter of a coin is in millimeters, say, a rational number. I doubt they've thought it that far. If you go and look at any website, they will give it to you some, some decimal places, which you can then say, all right, that's... But different websites, all claiming to be official, <laughs> give different decimal places at some point. So anyway, the following is true about the quarter nickel and dime, since I don't really know what the, the official size is, and I don't believe anybody does, is to the nearest millimeter, they all agree. So this one's 24, 21, and 18. I don't know why it's so bad here. Yeah? You'll see it in a moment. Uh, and the remarkable thing is if I do the following, suppose I put a circle in the middle here, all right? So there's a unique circle. I'll remind you, this is a theorem of Apollonius. That's why we call it an Apollonian packing. There's a unique circle that can be placed in the middle here so that uh, to be tangent to all three. It's only one circle. So suppose I take these three coins who have rational diameter and I place the circle in the middle there I claim the one in the middle also has a rational diameter. And that's very unusual. And for, th for three different size coins, this was the only one I found. Anyway, there's some Diophantine equation that the diameters, the three, three must solve. You, you need some invariant expression in the diameters to have a perfect, to be a perfect square. And it, this is the only case I found, as I say. But there are many ones you can cook up if you don't want to make them coins. All right, so that's the miracle we're looking for. This guy is a whole number. Now let me show you something remarkable. Let's multiply, let's scale the picture up. And instead of looking at the diameters, I'm going to look at one over the radii, the curvatures. Because I'm going to do something, I'm going to repeat this process infinitely often, each time putting a circle in each hole. So I explained the circle inside there. This time we put a circle outside. I'm going to put a circle there, a circle there, a circle there, and then repeat forever. And the miracle is if that fourth circle has a whole number, so now I'm looking at the curvatures, and what you're seeing is instead of the radii or the diameters, these are the curvatures of, of these circles. So this is 21, 24. If I put something here, it'll be smaller and smaller and smaller. The curvatures will get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the miracle is that once these four are whole numbers, then this process of putting circles in these loons, uniquely defined, gives whole numbers. So there's an integral structure to an Apollonian packing. I never knew this. Uh, I learned of Apollonian packing in complex analysis, where any three circles can be moved to any other three circles by Mobius transformation. As far as I knew, there was only one Apollonian packing. And when somebody pointed this out to me, Jeff Lagarius, said, you know, why don't you use your theory, which I won't say what it is, to study in the, uh, Apollonian packings? And I said, what are you talking about packings? There's only one Apollonian packing. He said, over Z, there are infinitely many. And go read my papers, he said. And sure enough, it's a gold mine. There's an integral structure here. So I just want to make clear that the Apollonian packing, once you start with your three circles, which are mutually tangent, is completely determined from then on, 
because the theorem of Apollonius, Apollonius is the father of conic circles, and he proved a lot of theorems about tangent circles, and one of his theorems says, given three circles which are mutually tangent, there are exactly two circles, like you... Oh. Oh, okay, the wrong way. Exactly two circles, one on the inside here, and in this case one on the outside, which are tangent to both. So this process is unique from now on, and we fill in, and the miracle is each time we put in a circle, the curvature is always integral. You never lose integrality. And you repeat this like so, and you repeat it again forever, and you get an integral Apollonian packing, and they are, not all of them are equivalent, there are infinitely many starting configurations, and everything I'll say to you here is true for any one of those. So that's an integral Apollonian packing. And people who've studied this from Apollonius onwards, although the integral structure here seems to be much more recent, I'll tell you who first started looking at this, are the basic questions are which numbers do you see there? Is there a local to global principle? You can't not ask that question. <laughs> are all numbers going to be curvatures or is there some congruence obstruction? And if there is a congruence obstruction, is it, can, if you meet it, then do you see every whole number there? So these are integral Apollonian packings about which we know quite a lot today. Are there infinitely many primes in this? There are many questions you can ask. Any question looks initially interesting and in the end is almost approachable by new techniques. So I should say that the first person to rediscover this, Descartes knew about some aspects of this, is a Nobel Prize winner, he discovered some isotope, Soddy. And because he was soddy, he wrote, put this in nature. I think if you try to put a paper about circles in nature today, they may say, who are you? <laughs> but he put this and popularized this, and he even wrote a poem along with this. He was so impressed with the fact that there's a relation between the curvatures, a quadratic relation which is connected with, with quaternary quadratic forms. I won't write the equation down. The Diophantine questions, as I said, were raised first by... Jeff Ligarius and his co-workers, five co-workers. This, uh, this was all done in uh, Bell Labs when it was still a math center. So they would work in teams, Ron Graham, Jeff Ligarius, Mallows, Wilkes, and Yan. It's a beautiful paper and a series of papers that followed there where they ask, they set up the Diophantine problems, they do some numerical investigations. So let me repeat what the questions are. What are the whole numbers there? You can ask many questions, but the question in view of Ramanujan's work is, I want to ask, what are the whole numbers? So, thanks to the last five or six years, there are many, many te new techniques which involve sieving theory, ergodic theory, infinite volume, hyperbolic, manifold, spectral theory, geometry, and most unexpectedly to me, additive combinatorics, theorems of Bergen, uh, Nets Katz and Terry Tao, who gave apparently the lecture recently, uh, from additive combinatorics, are actually used to prove a Ramanujan property in a setting which is very novel. So the contribu contributors here to the, this aspect, uh, I guess I wrote some letter, which I don't know how to work this thing, <laughs> and some papers with Gumbert, this should be a D, Bergen, and then Fuchs, Heo, Kontorovich, Vauju, Catherine Sandon, there are many people who have contributed to our understanding. I just want to talk about the local to global question, which is exactly the one like Romano Jones, which is the only problem of substance that remains unsolved, and it's the hardest problem. So, Fuchs in her thesis did what Romano Jones did to those one form you saw over there. What are the local obstructions? What congruences do the curvatures satisfy? My picture wasn't very good, but if I had bigger circles, you would have all noticed this anyway, I suspect, that all the curvatures are in that particular packing, and for every packing there's a set of congruences of allowable congruences that appear, and they are that, so for a manager, this would be uh, baby stuff, you just look at that and tell you what the congruences are by inspecting it that the curvatures all are congruent to one of these numbers, mod 24, and there are no other congruence obstructions. So that's the local analysis. The whole philosophy in, in number theory is local is supposed to be easy and global is hard. And showing local to global is when you enjoy yourself. 
So the local to global conjecture here, once this is understood, and which has been numerically experimented quite deeply by Sandon, is the following, that except for finitely many ends, just like Ramanujan's statement, and this list happens here to be massive, it hasn't stabilized at 10 to the 9, but we're so confident about the conjecture, we say there are something like 5,000 exceptions, but I'm telling you they're going to go away. That's because there's some reasoning that goes with it. Anyway, the conjecture, the local to global, is that every, the numbers which appear in an integral Apollonian packing, you ask a simple question, which integers are there? They're all integers which satisfy this congruence, except for finitely many exceptions. So it sounds like a problem which has very little to do with the other problem, and in fact the methods are very different, but it, in nature it's similar. And let me just say what the connection is to the Hilbert problem, Hil Hilbert's 11th problem is that when you work out following Descartes and Soddy, turns out that each time you put a new circle in this packing, you're taking the, f the you should work not just with one circle at a time, you should work with four circles at a time and look at the new configuration. And there's a symmetry group, which is a big Galois group of this picture, which produces the new circle from the old circle in terms of a formula which preserves integrality if the first four are integral. That's where that came from. That's Soddy's observation. But now we're trying to understand on what happens as we iterate this. And what happens is that all the points that you get, so the question of which ends are curvatures, is a question of looking at points on a cone, on a cone in four dimensions, an ordinary cone, integer points, uh, which, they said, that's the equation I haven't written down, so you're looking at all the points on this cone, which are in the orbit of this symmetry group, this Apollonian group. If this Apollonian group, whatever it is, it's a group of four by four matrices, if that group were big, if it were arithmetic, that's the standard number theory setting, then this orbit would be all the solutions and this problem of asking which n would quickly transform itself into a quadratic equation in three variables and you would have Hilbert's problem telling you how, that you have a local to global principle. But the group is infinite index in where it's supposed to live and that's natural because that's what happened with this group when you are generating it by reflections in this Apollonian way. So the question is much harder. It becomes a question of exactly of the Ramanujan Hilbert type where you're trying to solve a local to global principle on a thin group. And that's uh, where we have great progress. And I'll just give you a recent result just to show you that even on this problem which remains unsolved, we do know something, is the set of ends which failed to solve the local to global principle, the conjecture is that's finite. The best result we know is that set of ends is small in the sense it's got zero density. So it's a good chunk of the way, but still far from the end. And that's the theorem of Bergen and Kantorovich. Do you expect the group theory for the second set? Uh, what? Some no. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. The set is just big and finite. No. No, 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 no structure that I know. And I should say the critical ingredient is to prove in this generalized setting where you can make certain graphs associated with this Apollonian packing, finite graphs, is to prove they are expanders. So for me this has been a particular pleasure because it's the first time we're using ideas from probability and computer science to learn number theory. Usually it was the other way around. They, they would come and say, can you make a graph of this property? And we'd shout Ramanujan. <laughs> he'd, he'd show you how to do it. If you are. Now, they, uh, we are using techniques, as I said, from additive combinatorics and pseudo-randomness to prove a Ramanujan property, which is the most important property to execute a theorem like this or any of the other theorems. So, the upshot is I've come here to pay my respects to Ramanujan, whose ideas are profound. Thank you. Thank you very much for a beautiful talk. Uh, would you answer yeah, some yeah, questions? Yeah, if I can. Okay. <laughs> some questions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so far, they have little O up to X, the number of exceptions. 
but it will certainly be a power. The, be, uh, the expansion is it's just not, there's a tremendous amount of machinery that goes into that. Some part of that, which has to do with thermodynamic formalism, uh, is at this point not sufficiently polished to get the power saving. So they sh they, uh, it'll be a power saving, meaning the, no the conjecture is that the set's finite. They set of exceptions. The theorem will say the number of exceptions up to x is at most x to the 1 minus delta for some positive delta. That delta will be connected with the expansion, which we know exists, but can't even give a value to it in the setting. But it is exactly the kind of problem. So it's this quadratic equation, but on a set of points whose definition is through generators. The points, you take the orbit, you produce new points from old points, like you do when you reflect each time, and you produce these points, and they're not all the points satisfying the equation. They, so it's not a Diophantine equation, it's a subset of a Diophantine equation, a thin subset on which you still ha seem to have a local to global principle and a beautiful answer. Sandy. Sorry, I, I missed the connection between the proxy the proxy and stuff. Yeah. Right. Yes. Right. Yes, yes, that and is, that, yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, that is exactly, yeah, so this slide here, which Romana John knew well, goes back to Jacobi in some sense. Uh, this is, this statement here, that the number of representations of N by a ternary, uh, quaternary quadratic form, but actually any number of variables, three will not fall into Romana John's into what is called the Ramanujan conjecture, I'm afraid. Something more e exotic will be explained next week. But Rf of n is a number of solutions. The theory of modular forms, so there's a modular form that's constructed out of f, it's called the theta function. Its coefficients, like the tau, its coefficients are, the num are not just any old numbers, but they are the number of solutions to the equation on the one end. Now you actually go and find a nut. This is the old-fashioned modular forms. The space is finite dimensional, the space of modular forms. So if you can make another way of making them, there's going to be infinite sets of relations with all the coefficients. So you construct another set of modular forms. These explicit ones go by the name of Eisenstein series. They are entirely explicit. And the other ones are these mysterious cusp forms, which are the... the, the the atoms of the theory. And so we have this expression like this. This is very much modular forms. And Ramanujan's conjecture says that the coefficient of a cusp form is much smaller than the coefficient of an Eisenstein series. And hence the Eisenstein series, which is explicit, and the Eisenstein series captures all the local to global information. So this is got all the local to global, but only if n is big. And Ramanujan pointed out, I'd never noticed this before, he was extremely insightful, says the much more interesting and difficult problem of finitely many exceptions. Because then you, this is when N gets big, he knows his conjecture is going to hammer the thing. <laughs> he understood everything. Upshot, Vey was quite wrong. Hardy also knew this. <laughs> it wasn't, Hardy knew why this was in, interesting. I think he just said this tongue in cheek. We may be straying to the backwaters. They saw that red no more. <laughs> no, uh, you mean the no, circle pa no. There are no modular forms in this theory. This you are saying the finiteness is the condition, but it's not based on. It does not. Uh, no, no, no. So while. There was a theorem of Ono and Sander Rarajan, which I said implied an effective solution. That's because the Riemann there implied something about the Fourier coefficient, the sharp bound, without uh, more. Anyway, the Riemann, it may, the, this Apollonian problem uh, is no longer in the realms of ordinary modular forms. Let me clarify that. The group, the, the quotient space you're looking at, is infinite volume. I don't know how to connect it with Riemann. So we all, we in the realms, the, the, this Diophantine problem of Apollonius is about infinite volume hyperbolic three manifolds. Infinite volume. 
Now, the whole point in the theory of modular forms, the very definition of a modular form is you periodic and you have finite volume, so it means they're very few modular forms, they're very precious. Here we're in this flabby situation of infinite volume, and the only thing that survives is the Ramanujan conjecture in w some form. And that's what's being proved, a weak form of Ramanujan in infinite volume. No so his questions. idea is really profound. <laughs> okay, let's uh, thank Peter again. There's some tea outside.